And I'd also like to thank Wellstone Health System for serving as the title sponsor for our entire Newsmaker Luncheon Series. We also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Baker Hostetler, and our sporting talk sponsors, Georgia World Congress Center Authority, Lexicon Strategies, and the Southern Company. I'd like to ask Baker Hostetler's Ron Gaither to come up and say a few words to us. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Ron Baker. I'm a partner with the law firm of Baker Hostetler. I am also the vice chair of Baker Hostetler's sports uh, practice. And once I heard about this discussion, I lit up. This is what us sports nerds truly get excited about right here. Legislation impacting sports and how we consume sports. So one, let me thank the Atlanta Press Club for hosting this discussion. And also, let me extend just a thank you to the CEOs that are here today. Um, we really truly appreciate you guys giving us some time here to talk about these issues. I mean, this is unique. We got, you know, three of the, the big dogs here um, in a single room talking about sports and legislation, about how we consume sports. And so I think this is an absolute awesome opportunity. I'm Donna Lowry and with the Georgia Public Broadcasting. I'm the host of the show, Lawmakers, and I'm thrilled to be here today. So I'm at the Capitol every day and dealing with legislative issues involving uh, all kinds of things, but some of the things we're going to talk about today. And with me is the wonderful Eric Jackson, who I'll allow to introduce himself. Once again, it's great to be here. It's a pleasure. We've got a great crowd, I see, a lot of energy, so it's going to be a good one. All right. Thank you, Eric, for uh, joining me as we moderate this discussion with these, I like the, the term, uh, big dogs. <laughs> I like that. Steve Coonan, President and CEO of the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, Rich McKay, President and CEO of the Atlanta Falcons. And Derek Schiller, President and CEO of the Atlanta Braves. Darren Ailes, President of the Atlanta United, was not able to join us today. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you so much for being here as we discuss the, the 2020 legislative uh, session. We are, are going to start with sports betting, uh, talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into some other things. And of course, as you guys know from Newsmaker Luncheons, that at some point you'll have the chance to ask a few questions yourself. So let me give some background. In 2018, the, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned a federal ban on sports betting that opened the door to, to make changes and allow states to be able to do sports betting. And according to the legislative tracker on sports betting, that I, I found that the, since the ruling, 11 states have legalized sports betting, including New York, New Jersey, and Nevada, and then seven states have passed laws to make sports betting legal, but they are pending on a launch date. An additional uh, 24 states have pending legislation with eight states that have no action to move forward with legalizing sports betting. Currently here in Georgia, we have two sports betting bills are in, the, uh, in, in Georgia down under the gold dome, HB 857 and HR 380, and both are sponsored by Representative Ron Stevens of Savannah, and they both deal with basically getting an amendment um, onto the ballot for voters to be able to decide on this issue. So we're gonna talk about sports betting in particular, although we know there are other gambling issues, horse racing and casinos, but we're gonna start with sports betting. So my first question to you, uh, three is that um, all four of the major teams in the Atlanta area have banded together. I understand this is a first that you formed the Georgia Professional Sports Integrity Alliance. What is it, and why did you guys get together now? Go ahead, Who Steve. Wants to take it? Okay, I'll take it. I'm going sitting here first, but getting me in trouble. <laughs> You're closest to me. So that's Actually, the NBA. Commissioner Adam Silver was the first one to come out as an advocate for legalizing this $100 billion activity that's been in the dark, except in Nevada, for the last half century. And so this past summer, the three of us got together, had dinner, and, and said that we needed to align because this was an issue that will have a big time effect over our business, our fans, and our future. And so we put together this alliance, um, and there's a couple of key words in the alliance. First, integrity. Um, illegal gambling benefits nobody. There's no tax collected. The Super Bowl, which was 17 days ago or so, um, supposedly had $7 billion bet on it, and a fraction was bet legally. So there's no tax revenue. There's also a big, big issue um, 
in any kind of illegal activity, and that's the integrity of the sport using official data. And all of our league spends tens of millions of dollars a year to protect the data that our sports generates. Sports are analytics. You hear the word a lot. There's a tremendous amount of data. And then the other piece that we care about deeply is our fans. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here today having this conversation if it wasn't for the success of the mobile phone. Our whole advocacy is about mobile gaming. The world is mobile. In all of the states that you've listed that's approved, 83% of the gaming is coming through mobile. And so we, as the representatives of the sports teams, believe that bringing this from the dark into the light, regulating it, taxing it, and understanding all the guardrails of data that need to be protected around it are what's best for all of us. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I was gonna say, you know, it's rare, I want you all to know that four CEOs come together on any issue, right? Especially you know, something of this magnitude. I wanna ask you all, you know, going into, what, what was kind of the, the primary motivation to say, hey, we're gonna get into politics and we're gonna form this coalition? Well, um, some way, shape, or form, we're in politics basically every day I mean, in, in the various things that we do. Um, but I think when we had that dinner that Steve was referencing, we realized automatically that we had common interests. And we started talking about the issues, and we started talking about what could be in Georgia. Um, and we realized that we were all aligned. There was, there was unanimity in everything that we talked about. And so it wasn't really hard. Um, and you know, the fact is that what, what we know is happening out there, as Steve said, um, ultimately is coming is, is happening in Georgia but is happening in a legislative legal way in a political process in many many other states I think there's now 20 states that have this and so um, I think this is an opportunity for Georgia not to be left behind and for us to utilize the momentum that's occurring and utilize some of the resources that we have with respect to what we know are the things that work and need to be protected out of our sports to hopefully educate legislatures, legislators in, if they are to consider this, what is the best way to do that? Yeah. And, and what, in your mind, what is the best way to do it? Well, Steve mentioned the term, and it's, it's, in, our, it's in our title of our, our name for a specific reason, the integrity, right? So the very first foundational piece to this is that we have an integrity um, component to it. And what that basically means for us is that we need to make sure that um, we protect the sanctity of our sports. Um, you know, the, the, the making the sport um, something that the public can trust is at the very foundation of what we do. And so, obviously, a lot of the types of legislative um, bill writing concepts and ideas have to do with that first and foremost. The way that we get to that is maybe not as um, um, obvious as, as some of you might think. I mean, the way that we get to that fundamentally is first off, you know, uh, stating a couple of provisions that we all as professional sports teams are going to adhere to, but then secondarily is that we make sure that the data that is used for sports betting is official league data. And let me tell you why that's important, okay, because you might think, well, sports betting is happening, as Steve said, right now. We all know it. If we were to do a true, you know, you put the true serum in this room, how many people have bet on sports? Uh, I'm not going to ask that question, but it would be a really interesting to see how many hands go up. And, and uh, generally, the, what you do is you're using data that is um, being provided by whatever sports book, whatever sports booking entity that, that, you're, um, that you're dealing with. By using official league data, you're now making sure that the data that governs whether somebody wins or loses in a betting scenario is validated and confirmed by the league. And we're not just talking about wins and losses of a game. We're talking about all of the data. You know, our sport, baseball, obviously, is, is full of data. And, you know, to measure it all and have a validation of it all is extremely, extremely difficult process and important process. But each of us have various intricacies to our, to our league data. That is something that our leagues have worked on, and that is a key component of the legislation that we're suggesting needs to be drafted out there. 
Now we know bills here in the state to expand legal gambling have failed before. What makes you all confident that this could potentially be that breakthrough, you know, mobile sports betting? Okay, so I'll say something because I joined the alliance because Steve bought dinner for me. That, 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 just so you guys know, it's so easy. It's really not hard, right? Okay, um, and, and then th there's one more thing I, I would say that from my perspective, I think one one thing that's happening, obviously, in all of our sports is the way they're being consumed, right? So we talked about the fact that people are consuming them in different ways on tablets, on devices, whatever. Well, let's face facts: the, the phone is, is where a lot of the consumption is going in the streaming world. And that is where mobile sports betting is occurring. So to us, the idea that you can begin to engage with those people, uh, which in the state of Georgia is thought to be a billion five uh, was wagered last year illegally, uh, I, get, I guarantee it was bet on the phone. So in our mind, it made perfect sense to make that tie. I don't think we went into it thinking, um, you know, oh, we've got a 50% chance of winning, we've got an 80% chance of No, I think we, we got with the idea that we wanted to show uh, the legislature and, and, and the public that we think it's a good idea. We like the idea because we think it brings that billion five out of the dark and unregulated into the light and is a tax uh, revenue stream. I, we just don't see the negative in that. So that, that's the way we look at it. Yeah, so for people who may not understand it, you're not talking about being in charge of it. Explain oh. that. The teams are not. At no time are we in charge of it. At no time are we getting any revenue from it. We barely right. do our day jobs. So, <laughs> if so if you're not getting any revenue, why? Why get involved in this? Why do you want this? What do you get out of it? Plain and simple that people spend eight to 10 hours a day on their phone. It's the way they're watching. It's the way they're communicating. It is the way they are living their lives. And candidly, this is no different than the lottery who is going with Digi Mobile Games now. And our thought is this becomes part of the lottery. It's another game. It's administered by the lottery. The proceeds are decided by the legislature where they go. But this is nothing more. We are not the House. We are not making an action. We're doing this not for an economic gain in the literal sense, but to keep future fans engaged in our sport. You know, just and, because you were successful 50 years ago doesn't make you successful 50 and, years and ago. And what Steve just said is so appropriate because remember, our fandom right now, NFL-wise, NBA-wise, MLB, is fantastic, but it's getting a little older. And, and that group that's younger, they are on their phone more. They are betting more. They are, and, and for us to be able to engage with them there, yes, there's a benefit long term. Just more connection to the fan. Look at what fantasy football has done for us. It has been an incredible connection to that group. And then when we look at that group, we say, this is another way to connect with them, because they are absolutely doing it. Right now, they're just doing it in some offshore place. You know, placing bets at kiosk, and you know, overseas it's been successful in other places. You guys have decided not to include that in your you know, bill. What benefits do you see not requiring brick and mortar establishments, you know, just keeping it strictly to the cell phone? Well, I, I think a kiosk is, maybe right now, sounds like a decent idea to some. In, in some states, as you pointed out, they, they do have um, kiosks as part of the, the legislation that they've passed or are considering. Um, but as Rich said, the way it's occurring is on a phone. And so a kiosk is really an intermediary that you don't need. It's, it's kind of a hindrance. And then you start to think about, okay, where do you put the kiosk? Is there some sort of permitting provisions to that? Our view on this is we're going to just leave that topic alone. Our view is that, you know, not only today, but much more so in the future, it's going to occur on a mobile phone or a mobile device of some type. So let's just, let's just do it the way it's going to happen anyway. And also in a kiosk, how do you know that the person's 21? Yeah. To set up an account, you have to document. You have to put money on. There is no credit. <clears throat> this is literally registering, being approved, and with the guardrails that it's an adult versus a kiosk that people could come up to. Yeah. So let's talk about the revenue a little bit. Uh, down at the legislature, House Speaker Ralston has said, let's look at this. But on the other side, on the Senate side, Majority Leader Dugan, Mike Dugan has said that he doesn't really see it bringing in a lot of money that uh, of, <clears throat> of the gambling, of how horse horse racing and casinos that sports betting would not bring in a lot of money to the state. How do you yeah, let, let, me, let me take that just for a couple minutes. So um, first of all, it's really important that we have these issues evaluated on their own. 
So there are, as you pointed out, there are kind of three provisions of, of gambling being uh, discussed in, in today's legislative environment. One being sports betting, as we've talked about. For us, we've stated it's mobile sports betting, specifically, as, as we're talking about. The second is casinos, and the third is paramutual or horse racing. Our, our view is let these all be analyzed, viewed, evaluated on their own and on their own merits. And so the issue of revenue really needs to be taken in its, in its own distinct pocket. And what I mean by that is we should not be comparing one revenue slice to another and what one might do compared to another. You need to think about this, again, going back to the fundamental thought and the fundamental belief that I think everybody in this room knows that sports betting is happening today in the state of Georgia illegally, and the state of Georgia is receiving zero tax dollars for that. So the question really isn't how much revenue. The question is, it's happening today. Let's regulate it. Let's make sure that it's got all of the rules and provisions that should happen. And then, yes, there will be taxable revenue that comes as a result of that. And I would also say we have a distinct advantage in Georgia in that at least 14 states now who have enacted this, 20 total, but 14 are now live, I believe it is, we now are starting to see the early returns of those states. And I think it's a real um, opportunity to really showcase, quite frankly, the total revenues that are happening in states. Everything from, I think, you know, Indiana, over $130 million of total revenue. New Jersey, north of $300, $350 million. And in some of those states, that's either partial year and remember, it's just the first year of this. So there's, there's a lot to be built over the period of time. And I think, again, capturing the illegal nature of this, turning it in, into legal sports betting, is really found money. It's, it's not happening today. I, I would think that if, if you're the state of Georgia, you'd want this money. And if I was lobbying for horse tracks or casino, I would say the exact same thing. Because in a casino, the least profitable piece of a casino is sports betting. Why? It's because the player has the highest odds of winning. And so we see this as nascent growth. It's only been legal since 2018, and we're seeing this hockey stick growth. So it's a good lobbying argument. It's not a valid point because there's not illegal casinos all over Georgia generating a billion dollars worth of illegal activity. There are, is gambling, and that money through the lottery, through mogul, can easily be taxed in growth and licensed. Now, when, when you all say that, you know, uh, an increase in TV viewership and exposure and, you know, more commitment for the fans could potentially increase the bottom line for each of your, your teams? Absolutely. Somebody who bets on a game is 19 more times more likely to watch it. <laughs> right, but you, you all have said that you would directly benefit from the in another form of fan engagement. Absolutely, fantasy football is how much money we make off fantasy football in the NFL. That much money is it a good thing for us? You bet. The engagement we get with our fans and therefore the watching they do, absolutely. But we're already in long-term TV contracts. There's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Mm -hmm. um, it is the NBA ratings are down. Baseball ratings are down. NFL had a bounce back in ratings. It's about engagement, and that's what we care deeply about because what we don't want to be is non-competitive. Tennessee has approved this. North Carolina has approved it. As a native Georgian, I remember you couldn't get off the exit of 75 in Tennessee because everybody went up there to buy lottery cards. And we're going to create that same behavior of money leaving the state that shouldn't. And I would also say, I mean, if, if you're not a gambler in this room, if you don't bet on sports in this room, one of the things that's not only occurring today, but is more than likely, is going to happen with this, is that you're going to have a lot more gamification of this. And so when we talk about engagement, it's not only, you know, are you watching for a win or a loss? Are you watching for an over or an under? There's an enormous amount of, of games that occur during the course of each of our games that furthers that level of engagement, whether a guy's going to hit a home run in our case, or you know, is he going to get a strikeout as a pitcher? Is, you know, uh, what's the, you know, how many scores, how many runs are going to be scored in a particular inning or before this mound? The, the, the sky is really limitless as far as the gamification on that. And again, I think that has some great appeal already today to a lot of the young folks that are playing these games 
in this way in certain other states as well as in a lot of the daily fantasy games that are going on already. Yeah. So as you know, the, um, the opponents, including the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, um, according to one of the people who's a lobbyist down at the Capitol, Mike Griffin, he says, for every dollar raised in revenue, it costs $3 in social expense. How do you respond to that in terms of what the state might lose? Well, first of all, there's a provision inside of the bill that we're suggesting that will have um, dollars set aside to combat um, any kind of problem gaming um, that happens for somebody. So an educational component to that. But the other thing, and, and Steve mentioned this, but it bears some, some re-emphasis, is part of the opportunity to legalize this is that you can put certain parameters on this that really tightly control who can bet and also how they bet. So not only do you have age limitations on it, which is important, but you also have Credit limitations, said another way, you cannot bet on credit is part of what we're suggesting. You don't put you know, some sort of credit card down and say, my credit card's got 50,000 limit, I'm all in. You know? It is whatever you, whatever you fund into that, that's what you can bet. And that has an automatic deterrent against getting yourself into more trouble. I, I would again say, as part of this argument, it's happening already. So, so really, some of these control measures that I'm mentioning, plus others that are part of this, are really a way to take out of the, the, the illegal nature where it's unregulated and all of this mischief could potentially occur and turn it into something that is regulated and is above board and has these provisions that help. And it is, it, it, it's already going on. I mean, you're absolutely right about that. The thing is, though, it's still opposition out there. I mean, what is this that y'all's response to religious groups and others who say that gambling is immoral, uh, breeds crime, addictive? So I, I'm, one, I, I, I'm not going to get into the moral argument. I'm just getting into the argument of it's going on today. We all know it. We know exactly how much. We've seen it. And it is... Why wouldn't you then bring it out of the dark, into the light, regulate it, tax it, and put it in the right buckets? Just as, as Derek described, why, why would you not do that? You're not promoting something that isn't being done. You're actually regulating something that is being done. So to me, that's the way I look at it. And that's why I look at mobile sports gambling as, if Georgia is going to make a decision on gambling in the future, whether it's casinos, but you know, one of the nice things about it is, is to kind of use what the method we use at the stadium, we didn't get it exactly right, but we tried to walk, jog, run. We tried to, you know, we tried to open the building, then we, you know, and that's the nice thing about mobile sports gambling under the lottery using their current systems. You're literally just walking and you're doing it in a sports uh, betting world that exists today. So you've talked about, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, what confuses me with these arguments is that this is happening. And so if you're against the legal, Therefore, you're tacitly endorsing unregulated illegal because the behavior is not going to stop because some people are opposed. What we're saying is make it legal, make it regulated, make it taxed because it's not a behavior that's going away. So you've talked about it on the professional level. What about college betting? What about at the college level? Do you advocate that? No, our, our view, we, we specifically put the word professional inside of our alliance, and you only have professional sports teams up here. We're only advocating for the professional sports betting um, as part of this. Um, we'll leave it to the legislators, the politicians, to kind of debate the merits or not of, of college. I wanted to get y'all's thoughts a little bit. There's been a lot of talk on Capitol Hill about, you know, uh, the framework as far as name, image, and likeness and college athletes uh, receiving compensation for that. Do you believe that with the right guidelines or legislation that it could be beneficial for sports teams, given that a student athlete might stay a year or two if they have an extra couple of dollars in their pocket, a more finished product by the time they get to the program? I, I have an opinion on it. It's a personal opinion, so it's certainly not the NFL's opinion. I, it, it, I'm very concerned by it. Uh, I'm concerned by it because I, I grew up uh, the son of a college football coach, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, and uh, in those days it was called the Wild Wild West. And the reason it was, was there were certain programs around the country that they just had really good recruiting tactics, and they were really good at getting players. And, it, and I think it just, they were just really good at it. When you open up this door, I just want you to understand what you're opening up. And the fact that, you know, all of a sudden you're going to have a backup guard that's going to go to this big-time school, and he's going to be getting a deal to be on Joe's car wash because they really want his likeness. Um, 
So you're going to have to bring all the regulations that you brought in before are going to have to come back in. And it's going to get very cumbersome. It'll do, be good for lawyers. They'll be happy. Um, but, and, and I think that's what they're contemplating, because this is not so simple. There is a lot of manipulation that will go on. And in college sports today, you have the haves and you have the have-nots. You have the schools that are making a lot of money on athletics, and you have the majority of them that are not. And so all of a sudden, you're going you're gonna to open up something that <clears throat> sounds good, needs a lot of regulation, and people are going to need to understand the implications. To me, the number one thing would be you're going to have to go back and re-regulate all the recruiting uh, that goes on. I would also add, um, I was talking to Marianne about this, I, I have a daughter who's considering swimming in college. Um, she's just a junior. I don't know whether that happens. but. You know, speaking of haves and have-nots of schools, you also have the haves and have-nots of the individual sports. And that creates just yet another further kind of divisive or troublesome issue where you have, you know, two or three revenue sports in, inside of college versus others. And how do you deal with that? It's, it's really a Pandora's box. I mean, again, I'm, I'm speaking personally on this topic, not necessarily. And, and it's a tough topic because we've got states that have gotten ahead of the NCAA, so they have got to hurry up and get into this space, or it will be, it will be the wild, wild west. You'll have, you'll have schools. I, I just, I, I think that, you know, there's plenty of things to look at that you can take percentage of funds and you can dedicate it towards medical future. There's a lot of ways to get monies to athletes um, that are equitable and, and make sense. This one gives me a little, con I'm concerned. As you know, there, there is a, there's legislation down at the Georgia Capitol right now on this, so you, you guys aren't monitoring that the way you are the others. No, okay. no, no. I did want to, no. I did want to ask one other Unless thing Unless Steve buys me dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to ask one other thing about uh, the betting. How, how do you monitor the sports betting for your individual teams? Is there a strategy there, or is that not a worry? Oh, you talking about our, our yeah, actual people? Right. We have we have all the rules that we've had yeah. forever on that today. That won't right? change. That won't change. No, we've had those uh, forever. The nice thing about um, if, if, if the legislation were to pass, there's a bunch of regulations that allows that data to be shared in a way to make sure that nothing is going on inappropriately. But we have all those internal rules and controls to that. Each of the leagues. Each of the leagues. We take individual classes. We train all of our people. No tipping. No giving away secrets is posted all over both the business office and the basketball offices. So it's very clear what our role is not to be involved in that. And I don't think most people know that the proposed legislation that you got passed was based off Tennessee's. So what was it about their bill that stood out to you and said, hey, you know, this is something that we can get behind in our own state? Well, the, the legislation, when, you know, we had the opportunity, as I said earlier, to look at um, you know a dozen, fifteen different states who've, who've looked at this before, and, and Tennessee's legislation had a lot of the components that we all saw when we were sitting at dinner, saying, "Oh yeah, well, we, you know, that all makes sense. That has very similar consistencies to what we thought would be appropriate." Um, it is a mobile sports betting focused uh, piece of legislation first and foremost. Um, that's fundamentally what we like. We like the the safeguards as it relates to the integrity issues. They've got those are, in our opinion, very well written. Um, you know, the, the amount of taxation and the percentages of taxation are very similar to what we think would be uh, alluring to this state. And and also, you know, there's there's kind of a proximity thing. I mean, the fact is that they're a bordering state, and so you know, having something that's very similar to a bordering state is is a pretty good thing. You know, there's some anecdotal stuff if you if you follow. Um, New York versus New Jersey. There's, you know, there's, there's parking lots being dominated across the bridges and tunnels of, of, from New York to New Jersey, Manhattan, where people are literally driving across those tunnels and bridges, parking, placing their wagers because New Jersey is a is a sports betting state, and driving back. And so, you know, that stuff is occurring in a lot of states, as, as Steve kind of referred to in the in the days of old of the Georgia lottery, and something similar happening. So. You know, that's also kind of a, a consideration and perhaps even a motivation for Georgia to, um, you know, be progressive with respect to this. Yeah, I have heard some grumbling in Tennessee about the capping on the, the mandatory limits on payouts at 85%. Have you? I, I, I have not heard those There's as of yet. There's stories about it that people aren't happy with that. So 
You're, are you advocating anything different in terms of Georgia? I, I'm not familiar with that, okay. that, that particular issue, but um, I have not heard that kind of feedback. Actually, quite the contrary. What we've heard from Tennessee, especially amongst the state, the government, the politicians, and again, the people that are going to ultimately benefit from this, as well as the entities that are protected, they're very, very happy with the legislation. And we're very fortunate. We're partnering also with our sports leagues who are doing this around the country. So we get the wisdom of all the different states coming in. And, you know, last week we hosted several legislators and showed them the data collection, what happens in the building, and the millions of dollars spent to preserve and make sure that all the data and statistics were not only right, but were delivered in real time. I mean, with latency, like the one one thousandth of a second, it was stunning. You know, it took a while for the Hope Scholarship to get here. Do you, do you feel like it's an opportunity to finally get ahead, Georgia? It seems like they've been lacking in these sort of issues, you know, nationwide. You know, just, sure. well, just, you know, uh, Georgia, you know, getting ahead, um, you know, because other states have, uh, you know, proposed this bill already, you know, filed all this, this legislation. I feel like Georgia has an opportunity here to, you know, well, yeah. we're not here to evaluate where we rank in, in approvals, but what we're saying is without this, you're going to see a lot of money leaving the state. Um, so I think that's what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, right, right. I 100% agree with you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. As long, as long as you get a dinner out of it. You're good. We want to take some time now to kind of open this up and have the questions from those of you in the audience. So, like any questions out there? Sure. No? Who's shy? Oh, over here. Uh, I have a question for uh, the panel, but Steve in particular. Um, Arizona Cardinals player this year was suspended for betting during the season. Uh, you talked about the, the, the league itself and your individual teams monitoring it. Um, people of a certain generation remember the Black Sox. Um, is there always kind of a negative connotation with gambling that goes on in sports that people have and think, well, maybe somebody's on the take? And secondly, Derek, if this gets approved, should Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I'll go first. On, on the Cardinals player, yes. I mean, obviously the regulation and, and they, they caught the pendant and, and, and caught the player. Uh, absolutely we're always worried uh, about it. Uh, I think there's an awful lot that goes into it, an awful lot that all the leagues do to monitor it. Uh, so I don't, I don't feel like, we know the risk is there, but I think we've, we've for years gone through enough regulation where we understand how to mitigate that risk. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say it's one that uh, we're concerned with. Gambling wise, I think the interesting thing for me is just, I was in an owner's meeting this year, um, NFL owners meeting wherever we were, and they were talking about uh, Las Vegas and the stadium opening and everything. And I literally looked at the person that sat across from that table for me for 25 years and said, "Can you imagine? We're talking about a stadium opening in Las Vegas. Five years ago, we wouldn't have talked about being allowed the plane to land in Las Vegas. So times have changed, no question. Um, and I think as a league, we've embraced it um, because I think we feel comfortable that we can." Regulate it and look out for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you were going to forget about that second question. There. Right, thanks. Look, um, uh, uh, it, at, at the risk of anything ha happening from the commissioner level, I'm going to defer that particular <laughs> issue to Rob Manfred and the commissioner of baseball. But will I, what I will say related to it is not speaking about Pete Rose specifically, but I think actually that particular topic underscores the point of what we're trying to do, which is preserve the integrity of the game. Um, Steve mentioned it, Rich mentioned it, I've confirmed it, all of our leagues have very strict provisions in it with respect to um, players, coaches, front office, etc., and their participation in sports betting. This piece of legislation only furthers that, it only helps with that, that integrity issue. And so I think for the general fan out there, what I think it does is it really helps to solidify their belief and trust in our product. I'm really interested in the alliance and how it's come together. It's a one issue alliance as of this moment. Is there an opportunity that the alliance can end up weighing in on some other issues, specifically, and 
an issue that's looming out there is uh, religious freedom legislation, whether it has to do with uh, the adoption issue or uh, heartbeat bills or some of these things that I know for your businesses would probably be detrimental if Georgia were to pass some of that legislation. Well, I, first of all, I think that um, we, we've had a relationship. What's important to kind of give you a little bit of background on is that it's not like this was the first dinner that's ever occurred between the three or four of us. Okay? Uh, it was a good dinner, and Steve did pick up the check, which made it notable. He doesn't want to do that. Very notable. Very notable. <laughs> I noticed there hasn't been one since. We believe. Yeah. I, I think we catered some chicken fingers in some point. Yeah. Anyway, um, my point saying it is we, we actually have had a very loose and friendly, cordial um, dynamic. I mean, we, we share in you know representing Atlanta, representing this community in a way that um, we certainly understand, all of us sitting up here. We understand the gravity of what that is. Having sports teams that, you know, say Atlanta across our chest, go out into other cities and represent this community, and we all do various things to try to support that. And there's a, just a lot of commonality in, in kind of how we approach and how we think about our respective sports in the community. And there's a lot of things that we do together as sports teams that don't necessarily fall under this official alliance that we've created, but I will tell you that we've had these conversations as part of this where we've introduced other topics and have found even greater commonality than we even thought we may have. And so whether it be with respect to community-based projects, which we're all talking about some pretty significant things on that front, or other pieces of legislation perhaps, or other ways in which we can address topics as a collective voice. I think you've got um, a group that really understands and, and judging by the fact that this room is full and people are interested in talking to us not just because of the one of us but because it's all of us together, I think we probably have even more um, understanding that when coming together we're an even larger voice. Great. Way in the back there. Well, gentlemen, you're a general assembly session already. We've got no bill. When's the bill going to come? Uh, what's your over-under on when you're going to get on? Soon. <laughs> soon. Very soon. I've been told very, very soon. Um, uh, we're, today's You'll have to ask your bookie. I will tell you, we, we understand that question's been asked, and, and people are curious about it. And um, you know, Ultimately, that's up to the legislators involved to determine when the best time to introduce that is. But we've, we've been told that that's going to happen really, really soon. We also know that they, they're busy with some other things. The, the budget is a big deal. And that's why they're off this week. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, all three of you have mentioned uh, fan engagement is one of the things that you'll benefit from. Uh, I can think of some way, someone betting over and under, for example, might watch longer or stay in the stadium longer. What, how do you measure fan engagement, and what of those measures do you think will be impacted? So for me, fan engagement does not mean who, who shows up on Sundays, right? It, it is all about, are they watching? Are they engaged? Are they on our sites? Are they, you know, are they football fans? And we measure that all the time, as do the Braves, as do the Hawks. I mean, that, that's what we do. Because at the end of the day, you know, the, the bigger you can make that fandom, uh, the more you can produce on Sundays or Mondays or now or Thursdays and we're every day. Um, so to us, it, it's all about engagement in any way we can. And in our mind, in this area, what's going on is we have a huge group of people that are betting a lot of money, and we have no idea who they are. We have no idea what they're betting on. We, we have no idea. And so we may be engaging with them, but we probably aren't. And in our mind, the other thing for me is age. I just, you know, those 30... 40-year-olds, I just want to make sure that, that if they're there and they're engaged with us, we know who they are and we can reach out and touch them. So to me, that's where engagement's going to matter. I love viewership, but let's face it, today we have a lot of people watching a lot of games. We have a lot of people streaming a lot of games. We have a lot of people that in no way are we measuring. We have no idea. We get all these estimates, but they're all estimates. Um, it'd be nice to touch those people. And what we see is so much of our games are consumed 
through Twitter and, and through Instagram and through highlights, um, that the game's not being consumed the way it is. If you're thinking with a 40, 50, 60 year old mind, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a generation that grew up with everything at their fingertips. We're talking about a generation that allegedly has an attention span of second less than a goldfish. <laughs> We're talking about a generation that wants to be able, who grew up on games and the gamification of life. And so this is part of their DNA. This, this doesn't wear a, 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 you know, a black hat and happen in a corner in a dark bar. Playing games and being able to engage with the product Fantasy sports have been a huge boon to all of us. And what we don't want to be is a state that doesn't have it and find out 25 years from now it hurt the business of professional sports in Georgia because we have a lot of fans, millions of fans. We have a lot of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs that are spent from our businesses. And we believe because we've seen it happening in markets that this is one of the best engagement tools available. Yeah, so on, on that, fantasy sports, fantasy football, for us, I was in a room um, you know, 20 years ago when, when all of a sudden there was this decision made, you know what, we're gonna monetize this fantasy football. There's a lot of revenue here. We're gonna have a paid way in, you're gonna, and, and, and it worked for a year. And then the next year we had a meeting and some people, really smart people, stood up and said, you know what, let's not monetize this at all. This is the, the wrong thing we can do is try to monetize. This is all about fan engagement. This is all about bringing people to our sport. This is all about them consuming it in whatever way they may want to consume it, as opposed to us dictating to them. And that has really, really served us well. Yeah, I kind of, you know, speaking of age, I kind of want to open it up a little bit. How many, uh, show of hands, how many gamers do we have here? Or, kid, or you have kids who are gamers? Yeah? A lot, right? So esports has become more popular than ever. I just wanted to ask you all, what are you guys doing in each of your uh, franchises to embrace esports, you know, as a, another avenue to engage younger generations? Um, before, before we talk about esports, I'd almost say that each of our leagues, in, including Darren and, and MLS, have platforms that basically take our sport and represent it on some sort of gaming console. And, and actually, there's probably an argument that um, a lot of the Gen Zers are being introduced to our sport, becoming fans of our sport through that medium first before they ever attend it. So um, we are working collectively, individually as leagues, teams, in trying to figure out how to, how to grow our fan bases in ways that you could have never dreamed of in the past. I was, I was actually just talking about the Gen Z group amongst a, a, a group of, of MLB people. And um, you know, in that younger 20 group, I saw some stat that said, if, if you're a male Gen Zer in that, in that group, your most famous celebrity, if you were to go back 20, 30, 40 years ago, was probably an athlete. If you do it today, you know what it is? It's a social media influencer. And in fact, if I were to throw out a name of who that is, I bet most of the room doesn't even know who it is. So I'll throw out the name. And yeah, there's no way you got this right. I is it Cooney? It's not Cooney. It's not Cooney's face of efforts. He's done some videos. Uh, PewDiePie. Anybody heard of PewDiePie? Yes. A couple people in here who have Gen Zers. Right, the rest of you are going, who the hell is PewDiePie? <laughs> but, but, but I guess the only, reason I, the only reason I tell that story is we all have to be very, very uh, progressive and, and different in the way that we approach our respective markets, grow our games, and it's happening through things like gaming consoles and, uh, and other, other methodology, including esports. Christy, I know you had a question. Yeah, I have a question about the data. You mentioned that illegal gambling doesn't necessarily have access to correct statistics all the time. So how are you going to work with gambling companies or game companies to provide the statistics? How, what is that process and what kind of kickback or fee or how percentage are you going to charge for? <laughs> we won't charge that because we don't generate the, the data the league does. Yeah. And we're hoping it's part of the legislation. It should be. It needs to be to protect. So again, it, I, I hear your skepticism, not usually I, the first time in 50 years, three heads of sports leagues 
have sat up here together and we're asking you to advocate for something we're not making any money for. <laughs> I, can, I can understand the feeling of skepticism there. But I think you have to put what Derek talked about is your future habit.